Good evening, and thanks so much for coming out this evening. Welcome to the Wall Exchange, a UBC centennial session. I'm Derek Gregory, one of two Peter Wall Distinguished Professors at UBC. The Wall Exchange is a series of downtown lectures hosted by the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies at UBC. We're dedicated to advancing innovative and fundamental research that can generate new ideas, new thinking, and ultimately make important contributions to society. Our objective in the Wall Exchange is to help us collectively engage in conversations about important and timely issues. And tonight's conversation promises exactly that. But first of all, please join me once again in thanking our house band, The Straight Jackets. I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, the UBC Centennial Office, Georgia Strait, the TAI, CITR Radio, and our media partner, CBC Radio. Thank you to Paolo Pietro Paolo, journalist and host, who will serve as moderator for this evening's Q&A, as well as CBC Radio One, who are recording this evening's discussion for a future CBC Ideas broadcast. Let me explain the program this evening. A.L. Weitzman will speak for around 45 minutes, and following his talk, Paolo will moderate a 45-minute question and answer period. Behind me on the screen, you can find our Twitter hash handle, at Wall Institute, and the hashtag, WallX. In addition to the microphones at the front on either side, we'll be taking questions tonight via our hashtag. Please send your questions in during the lecture and in the first two minutes after the lecture finishes. Paolo will ask a handful of them tonight to tonight's speaker. Tonight's lecture and the Q&A will also be made available as a video and a podcast on our website. Eyal Weitzman is Professor of Visual Cultures and Director of the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmith University of London. He currently directs the European Research Council funded project, Forensic Architecture. I first met Eyal 10 years ago in East Jerusalem. We were both heading into Ramallah to give a series of lectures and begin a series of conversations. And soon after that, Eyal published the book which, perhaps more than any other, established his global reputation, Hollow Land, an extraordinary, creative, critical account of the part that architecture played and continues to play in the Israeli occupation of Palestine. But what often gets lost in the shuffle, I think, is that Eyal is also a qualified practicing architect. He's designed apartments. He's designed restaurants. He's designed installations, even theater sets. But much more recently, he began what he describes to me as his descent, a concern with architecture not simply as construction, but as destruction. Now, in my own work, I spent some considerable time looking at drones and at the full motion video feeds that make killing from the air possible. And those images have been described by Haroon Farooqi as operative images, images that do something. But when Ayal explores forensic architecture, he has no access to those kinds of images, but as we'll see tonight, a whole series of other images of the aftermath. And what he'll show us, I know, is that those images too are operative images. Those images seen in the right way can trigger all sorts of things, not least forensic investigation and even calling the guilty to account. Eyal has given a series of major lectures around the world, including the Nelson Mandela Lecture and the Edward Said Memorial Lecture. So we're absolutely delighted that he was able to accept our invitation this evening. Please join me in welcoming A.L. Weitzman. Thank you all so much for coming. I am absolutely delighted uh, to be here with you, although I can not see you. I'm sure you're here. And I know that there will be a day when I will be in Vancouver and I could see the city without a jet lag, so I'm looking forward to that. 
Um, thank you very much to the Wall family, to Derek and Gaston for initiating, for Bernadette and Nicola for making it possible. Thank you all for coming. I'm honored to be here with you. This lecture draws from work on a spatial research agency that I established in 2010 under the name of Forensic Architecture. But what is Forensic Architecture? Well, one way to explain it is by saying that a forensic architect is a building surveyor. A forensic architect is for a building what a pathologist is for the human body. But there's another dimension to forensic architecture, and that is that the building survey that is undertaken is presented in court. Well, we know building surveyors. They come to uh, our houses. They look at cracks in a wall or at leaks, and they try to establish the reason for that, and sometimes that would be helpful in, a, in some kind of claim, some kind of insurance claim uh, or, or another. But increasingly, there's a new arena of work for forensic architects, and that is that right now, most conflicts that happen worldwide take place in cities. Baghdad since 2003, Jerusalem, Ramallah, Jenin, and Nablus since the occupation and, and perhaps before, Beirut, and more recently Syria, Damascus, Sana, Kabul, and Benghazi across and beyond what Derek Gregory, that person that just introduced me, called the colonial present. When war takes place in cities, buildings and neighborhoods become target. <clears throat> And not only they become target, most people that die now in wars die within buildings. And the majority of those people that die within buildings die in their own homes. And that was the case in the most recent Israeli attack on Gaza, for example, but also in other places, like in Waziristan, for example, uh, under attack by US drones, something that I think we would learn more about as the new intercept um, new leak is coming and, and analyzed. Cities are complex entities, and urban warfare, a war in the city, is equally complex. It involves not only combatants on both sides, but increasingly, of course, the civilians that live in a city. And it unfolds within an environment that is saturated by media. And increasingly, that media is social media that uh, arrive at our screens via the internet or the main, mainstream uh, channels. For forensic architects, building our evidence. For us, we read history, archaeology perhaps. We undertake a certain archaeology of the present by looking at those ruins, by interrogating them very closely, by trying to reconstruct what it is that led to the ruin to be disposed, to the material of the building to be disposed in that particular way, and to make claims, juridical claim, but also political claims with architecture and its materiality. So whereas the building survey that would come to your house can undertake forensic architecture as a haptic practice, perhaps going with a notepad, touching the walls, in war situation, very often, we cannot be there at a time when war is destroying the cities, the communities, the neighborhoods uh, that uh, are so precious to us. Most often, we need to see them as they're captured through the media. So we have here, and you will see through this lecture, the way in which building survey becomes complicated by the very media in which it is captured. But all that for what? On behalf of whom and against whom? Let me answer this question by taking a little detour. We need to speak very briefly about the origins of forensics. We're increasingly becoming familiar with this term from all sort of CSI programs on TV, right? I mean, we all know what forensics is. Uh, we understand it simply as the application of science in a legal context, but this hasn't always been the case. The word forensics come from the Latin forensis, which means those things which pertain to the forum. 
And for the great Roman orator, Cicero, Quintilian, for example, those people that use these terms, the forum was not only the court. It was meant as something much more chaotic, a public sphere, a space of circulation, economy, politics, and free speech. And in that respect, I want to say how moved I was to see a note being um, distributed outside uh, that is called, by, or by an organization called Seriously Free Speech that wants to expand the free discussion and free speech on issues of Israel-Palestine. In modernity, the term forensics got telescoped. It meant the application of science in court, but something public and political was lost. Um, something that the word forensics has and forensics does not have, and that is its political public potential. And this is important because forensics has became or became the art of the police. Indeed, the modern history of forensics is the history of the techniques by which we are governed. It's the history of the technique by which states monitors its population. And it spans from the 19th century pseudoscience of phrenology leading all the way to the NSA digital eavesdropping of yesterday. And this leads, as you see here, to attempt to escape that gaze of the police. Here, a migrant trying to, a refugee trying to arrive and establish a new life in Europe, has to erase his fingerprints because in order to avoid the identification that would lead to his deportation. This could be called counter-forensics, camouflage from the evasion or disruption of the process of police forensics. But counter-forensics is also about inverting the forensic gaze of the police. From state policing its subjects, counter-forensics is about citizens committed to monitoring states, to monitoring the police, challenging the claims of states, especially when they are engaged in wars or in other acts of state violence. Turning forensics against the state is essential because states tend to cover its traces or the traces of their own crimes. State violence tend to be two things. It is both a violence against people and things, but it is also a violence against the evidence that violence has at all taken place. And this is not simply a rhetorical act when continuous perpetration of violence depends on its very negation, right? Perpetration and negation form an entangled form of violence. Turning forensics against a state is thus essential. What are the forums of forensics or counter-forensics? Some of them are institutional, and you would know them, like various UN commission, and here is our work presented in various uh, UN and... Um, Human Rights Council inquiries in Geneva and in New York. Um, what we do is really is to provide and prepare evidence files, including building survey, architectural models, 3D animations, video analysis, and interactive cartographies. But these are not enough. The forms we present in are both political and legal. They are also truth commissions, advocacy reports, and uh, political forums. Our agency is not composed only of scientists and lawyers, although we work with scientists and lawyers, but it is composed of architects and artists and filmmakers because we believe that when the evidence is such an important evidence today for state crimes exist in buildings and in images and in videos, we need the peoples who can decode the messages in them, who can look and interpret videos. Uh, and these are often image practitioners, aesthetic practitioners uh, that do that. Now I would start taking you through a series of investigations uh, that we have undertaken in forensic architecture. None of them would be exhaustively uh, unpacked. None of them really uh, will be complete. These are, this is just a, a more like a survey of uh, techniques and, and, uh, that we have developed and thoughts that we had uh, around these techniques. And the rest and the kind of the full political juridical implication of them, you could later, if you're interested, 
um, investigate on our website. But let me start with Waziristan, the border region between Pakistan and Afghanistan that has, was most exposed uh, to drone warfare uh, in the last decade. And the work that we were involved uh, in, together with the Bureau of Investigative Journalists, uh, the UN, and a Pakistani lawyer named Shezad Akbar in pursuing action against drone warfare, in exposing something that was continuously denied and, um, and undertaken. And we have, in fact, received that commission from the UN because of a growing understanding that what we are looking at in all those strikes that we have mapped here from local reports are attacks on buildings. In fact, 61% of all strikes on targets in uh, Waziristan are targeting buildings. And therefore, it is um, the forensic architects that were called in. So this is kind of the distribution of target type that you could see. There are very, very few images of buildings destroyed by drone strike. And the reason is that the area of Waziristan is under a siege. We think about drone warfare as a line that connects a technological platform with a target on site. But drone warfare depends on very exhaustive and extensive set of infrastructure and on a siege that is imposed on the area, on very traditional kind of territorial, large-scale territorial uh, apparatuses. For example, the siege is denying people, journalists, photographers, or indeed every person that carries a camera or a smartphone from entering or exit that area for the precise reason that images of, of, those, um, of the results of drone strikes uh, would, not be, uh, would not be seen. But when they are leaked out, when we do see them, and now I speak architecturally, they tend to have a very unique and precise signature. And that is that drone strikes on building always result with a hole in the ceiling, a small hole in the ceiling through which the rocket, Hellfire, Spike, or any other rocket enters into the building. Now, this is a photograph from Gaza but exposing the same principle. Why they do it? Because they want the rocket to enter, not to, bl not to blast on the ceiling of a building and leaving all the explosive force outside, but to enter deep into the architecture and when they're in the middle of the room to spray hundreds of small steel fragments to kill uh, the people inside. So that is the signature that we would see. And sometimes those holes in the ceilings are very small. Look, that's a strike. Here it's a, a, it's a very small strike of four centimeters. Only the, the warhead um, of melted steel has entered through the building. Now we are looking at it at the ceiling underneath the roof. It's the same hole. And it can go through two layers of floors. In that case, it has landed on um, a bed of a child in Gaza. That's an Israeli drone strike that was undertaken in 2009 after the Israeli attack, the previous one of 2008, 2009. Sometimes they go through two layers of floors. The problem is that when the UN asked us to do it, the satellite image that they provided us were pixelated in a way that we could not see those holes. The reason is that for legal reasons, the American, uh, there's, there's a law that was passed by Congress called the Remote Sensing Act of 1998 that would not enable the resolution of, of satellite images to be sharper than 50 centimeters a pixel. 50 centimeter a pixel is the size of my podium, but it is also a size of a person from above. The reason was initially that of privacy. The resolution was there to stamp people out of the photographs. Uh, in architecture, we speak about the modular, right? The kind of the unit by which of the human body uh, by which architecture is established, architectural proportion is established. The 50 meter a pixel, the size of a human from above, is the modular of the satellite 
uh, image. But it also hides the violation. Uh, there's only one place where the resolution is degraded even more. The, that very same remote sensing app, 1998, makes an exception. Above Israel and the territories it's controlled, the occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza, the resolution is that of 250 centimeters a pixel. The modular is a car, and guess why? So here we are in a situation where the satellite image, the size of the pixel is larger than the size of the hole in the ceiling. That means that the violation is at an optical or forensic status that is referred to as the threshold of detectability, right? In, so the frontier of, or the frontierization, kind of othering of, of Waziristan is not only a siege on the plan, on the sides, from all sides on land, it is also a filtering of information from above, right? The kind of uh, optical siege operates through the satellite images. So in the UN, when they look at places like Darfur, they could see in before and after images a kind of an archaeology of destruction. A village that was uh, in Darfur that was intact in the image before is completely destroyed in the one after. But if we look at that school in Miran Shah, in uh, South Waziristan, we would look at the, at the place and we see before and after, we know that four people died in that building, but we can see no difference. The missile has entered within one of the pixels. And this is exactly what enables what the American call the glomer response, a form of denial that seeks to add no information whatsoever, a form of denial that neither confirm nor denies the existence or non-existence of documents related to that warfare. And it is because no images were coming out that American um, speakers could actually explain that people were dying in South Waziristan out of bombing accidents. The glomer was obviously about the American whose existence the, um, your neighbors from across the border wanted to neither confirm nor deny. So what do we need to do in a situation like that? State forensics is based since the 19th century on the foundational assumption that to resolve a crime, you need to see more than what a criminal uh, has seen. If somebody is producing a crime, perpetrating a crime with a naked eye, the police would need to have a microscope or a telescope. Um, but in counter forensics or in forensics, you would also see, always see less than what um, the, the, the military or the CIA uh, would see at the time. Killing is undertaken in high resolution and the investigation in low resolution. And that is what opens a space of denial. And this is why we cannot leave forensics purely or counter forensic to the scientists. This is why we need to work with architects, artists, and filmmakers, because we need to find ways to bypass that epistemological barrier. And one of them is returning to the witnesses, returning to that element that uh, allows us uh, to see and to know things that perhaps even the CIA uh, would not, and to make claim uh, with them, or to help them make political claim. And such a story happened when um, a, a woman who prefers to remain anonymous, who managed to escape siege line and arrive back to Germany, she was a German uh, woman, um, started to be involved in advocacy campaign against drone strike, and she has actually survived a drone strike over her home, and some members of her family uh, died there. But uh, very often, with all um, people that suffer the worst, it is that the very moments that are most crucial, the most traumatic moment, is erased from memory. And this is a mechanism of dealing with, with one's trauma. But when a willing witness wants uh, to recall, 
you need to work together with a psychoanalyst or psychologist in trying to reconstruct it very carefully. And together with that witness, understanding that there is something architectural in the structure of memory, we have uh, devised a, a technique of building an architecture model together da with her Takunacht. from a sketch that she's made. We've Hier built together this architectural model. Um, in fact, she has built it. We just facilitated it technologically. And as she was building it very, very precisely, yes, okay. returning to the precise element of her house and completely taking charge of the process of building, moving very precisely every door and window uh, in it and uh, recalling that process. I'll skip it. Moving the elements uh, of the room uh, inside the beds, etc. Uh, she started uh, to recall very slowly uh, what has happened there. Uh, in fact, one of the elements that were very important in the entire process of reconstruction was a fan. And she remembered it initially as a ceiling-mounted fan. And then she returned to it again and again, moving it left and right. Then she recalled, no, actually it was a standing fan. And then she moved it from one side to the other, and we did not understand why. When she started uh, constructing or reconstructing the destruction, and returning to it in a kind of a fully rendered walk through her home, she recalled that the most traumatic thing that she has seen, pieces of flesh of a dead body of a family member was found on the blades of this fan. And in fact, that fan is a media kind of artifact. It's an anchor to memory that open up uh, the process and, uh, uh, of this uh, analysis. But there are other kinds of testimonies. Testimonies are not only um, related to memory. There's new forms of testimonies that are coming in the form to us in the form of clips that people are recording. In the summer of 2012, such testimony uh, was actually made public, a 22-second long video that was smuggled outside of Miran Shah, Waziristan. It had to pass six hands before it has arrived at the broadcasting uh, agency uh, of NBC in Islamabad and uh, was made public. And here is what you see. Here is what was broadcast. Uh, you see what, what is very typical to um, social media uh, or kind of user-generated content, um, images of destruction. Uh, it is almost uh, it's a confirmation that there is a ruin somewhere, but we did not know uh, what could be interrogated. And we worked for months and months on this video and looked at each frame. And the one thing that struck us initially was how large is the window frame inside the picture frame? And why is it? You know, every camera records with two ends of the camera. It records what it's aimed at, and it's recording something of the state of the person that's recording that video. And if that person does not lean outside of the window, or is a meter inside or more inside the room, that person perhaps is scared by crossing the window line. And why is this person feeling threatened or scared? I do not know. Perhaps it's a, a double strike. Perhaps they're afraid of another drone strike. Or perhaps that person is afraid of Taliban. Um, and, uh, but regardless, the presence of the window frame inside the image frame is information. It is not erasure of information. And it means that what we are seeing is a testimony delivered under risk. It's a form of testimony that Foucault, for example, called parhesia. This is the kind of the most precious ones, um, testimonies that, that take really risk both to record and then to smuggle out. So we honoring that risk is about looking is very, very carefully at every frame within this video and seeing what is coded within it. Where is this building? What do we know about it? What do we know about the room in which it happened? And looking at every frame, uh, we see some things that will be very obvious. For example, shadows. Shadows uh, is a very useful thing because you know that we are looking northwards uh, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, we also know that we are looking at a building that is lower than the window we're looking out of. 
right? So we have a higher building looking onto a lower building. And what we do is we compose a panorama out of every still within that. And for the first time, we can see the ruin, the full ruin. And we're looking for distinct elements in this photograph. We're seeing on the left a certain distinct bend in the road or turn in the road. On the right, we see a certain widening of the road. And we see also, um, so, so we are looking now through Miran Shah for all buildings that have higher buildings in the south, lower in the north, and have that kind of road disposition. And we find them, and then we start corroborating. Can we find one of the first buildings located in which drone strike happened? And we see uh, a certain fanning of the beam here, and we see all, all, also on the satellite image a certain fanning uh, of the beams in the same place, but that's not enough. We need to corroborate more. We see a high tower. Here it is in the shadow on the satellite image. We see another high building to the left of it, and it is indeed, and also that together with the disposition of the road make us believe that we might have indeed found the location of that building. But what else can we tell uh, from it? Because whatever we do, the, um, the resolution uh, would, be, would be much in which we would not know within which of these pixels is the one proof, the signature of the drone strike, the hole in the ceiling. We cannot see it uh, in the pixel. So what we do is that we reconstruct a model. And in this model, we are locating it in a city, and we're trying to do some very basic things that every architectural student knows how to do. We're simulating the shadows. Here is a, a model that we've done of the building after the strike, and we have those shadow lines on those still images. And we very carefully simulate the shadows so that we would know what time that image was taken, and we figure out it's around 3 o'clock. And if it's 3 o'clock, we can move on and know more things uh, about the building. And this is because we saw also another space, and that is the space underneath which we composed like that into a panorama. And in this space, we see a sunspot. And we know it's 3 o'clock. And we know the direction of the sunspot. So we can use it as an anchor to rotate the, the building and find the location of the room within that building. And then we look very carefully at the room underneath. And now people are actually less careful. They're showing their hands. And they're showing bits of the missile. Is it an American manufactured missile? We're looking at all fragments that were found in the Bureau of Shazad Akbar. And we're trying to look of where that fragment came from. Is it part of, a, of the explosive of an American manufactured drone? And we can confirm that. But we see something else behind the hand. We see a certain shrapnel on the wall, a certain clipping on the wall, and we start mapping them, all of them. We start looking at all those uh, fragments scattered on the wall very, very carefully, days of work, looking at each one of those. Uh, you know, this, this is composed out of hundreds of steel frames, and we locate each one of them. And then when we locate them all, we see that there are two places in this image that have less fragments in them. And we think these are the places where people died. Because if bodies were there on the way, they would have absorbed that shrapnel. And, and in fact, um, their shadow is now etched onto the wall. That wall is like a photograph exposed to the blast, like a negative is exposed to light. So here you see forensic architecture and pathology combined, because it is a photograph of a dead body that is recorded on architecture uh, itself. This is a, a, a thing I did not want to show that, but I put it in because of the escalation uh, in Palestine recently. You know that right now there's a certain uh, resistance that is happening, um, in, especially in Jerusalem, against uh, Israeli, um, uh, the Israeli occupation policy in Jerusalem and in the West Bank. And, um, there is violence on both sides, and there is a certain open fire, open season almost, uh, in which the government and, and, and politicians would encourage civilians to carry guns and shoot at anyone uh, with, with, a, uh, with a knife in their hand rather than arresting and trying to neutralize them in other ways. Um, and that is part, and, and, and kids, teenagers are dying um, 
uh, on both sides, but also Palestinians are being um, continuously killed. And that is uh, something that I have uh, undertaken, an investigation that forensic architecture has undertaken uh, in, with, a, with a wonderful team of, of researchers uh, for DCI Palestine on uh, Nakba Day, May 15, uh, 2014. Because it was Nakba Day, there were many cameras on site. It's a day in which Palestinians commemorate the Nakba. Uh, it is a day that there are always clashes, and during those clashes, um, uh, two Palestinian boys were shot and killed. Here you see Nadim Nawara uh, being shot. Uh, he was not doing, uh, not involved in any activity at the time. Uh, the Israeli government uh, and the Israeli military denied involvement, suggesting perhaps that Palestinians have shot uh, that person. Uh, working for DCI Palestine, a Palestinian human rights group, and indeed for the father of Nadim Nawara, the, the, the kid that got shot, um, we were producing a series of studies. The first one of those is an attempt to sync up two cameras that were on site, a CNN camera that was, uh, and, and a CCTV camera on the left that was shooting the same event. In order to sync them, there's 25 frames a second, and you need to find the exact frame. Um, by an analyzing it, when you find the same frame, you can actually rewind both videos and see what happens at the moment, at the precise moment, when the Dim Nawara is falling uh, to the ground. The CNN camera is actually aimed at a group of Israeli soldiers. You would see that at the precise moment that Nadim is falling, one of those soldiers is seen shooting from uh, behind uh, a bush. Even that was not enough. This is our Minister of Defense uh, in relation to studies uh, like that, to, to the video studies. Um, also ours says, I've seen plenty of edited videos, right? And they were suggesting that there was not even a trajectory between that soldier and Nadim Nawara. Therefore, we needed to, to investigate that. Um, in Palestine, we have many people on the ground. We located precisely where the soldiers stood, and we do what architects do. We build an architectural model of it, which is measured and uh, corroborated by satellite images, and locates the two cameras, the CCTV camera and the CNN camera. Here's the CCTV one. And, uh, and moves uh, between the kind of the, the image and the model and um, try to establish a very, very basic fact. Was there a trajectory? Uh, we get the pathological report, the point of impact, and we, we connect it to the soldiers. We take the image, we break it into a three-dimensional model, and we could see something that we shouldn't have even had to show because it was so obvious. Of course, a trajectory exists, and still it was denied, and still they said the bullet that was found is not the right bullet. Uh, Etc. We had to undertake a closer study. Here we are back in the, in the sinking video uh, in which there are actually two shots being fired. And we are trying to now establish uh, by sound, for some reason the sound doesn't work here now, um, we are seeing in, in the second shot, while Nadim Nawar is being carried, we're seeing something that we, we couldn't believe we're seeing. We're actually seeing a rubber-coated steel bullet in mid-flight. So we have the signature of a rubber-coated uh, steel bullet. It is that kind of intensity of looking at images that becomes very important. Again, I do not know. So we can, we can develop a kind of a signature of a, a live fire and a rubber-coated steel bullet here in the good work of one of our team members, a sound artist by the name of Lawrence Abu Hamdan, who uses uh, his own software to create a kind of a sound signature of these killings and, and connect it uh, to others. Here is the, the killing of another kid. We only have here the sound. We do not have a picture of the soldiers doing it. Now we need to compare the sound. Is it a rubber shot or is it a live shot? And um, so what we do, we source from, from Palestinian TV and from Palestinian activists all the videos that were on site in order to start um, mapping out sound, the soundscape uh, of this event, and looking at one shot after the other. What is the sound signature 
of it. What is a rubber shot and what is a live shot? And uh, we're able to establish, and this is something here, that was the live shot and another rubber shot. And by making that, again, the full investigation and its political consequences are actually online. We do not undertake specific investigation unless we can also show if we, if we look at a day or if we look at a moment of, of somebody's uh, killing or assassination or um, other violations, we need to unpack it both in its absolute specificity and also reconstruct the world in which such violation can take place. It is through the micro-investigation that we want to be able to comment on the macro one. But here in this case, uh, we have been able to help identify uh, the killer uh, of uh, Nadim Nawar and Mohammed Abu Daher, who is now uh, facing um, trial, trial that has been uh, two days ago, uh, again postponed. How frustrating. It was a strange feeling to undertake that investigation of, in the summer of 2012, because while we were doing it, while we were looking and studying for the father of those children, um, the, um, uh, the detail of, 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 of those killings, there were so many other killings that were undertaken uh, in the Israeli summer attack uh, over Gaza. But in fact, during that war, we, uh, we were starting to work together with Amnesty International and a coalition of Palestinian NGO. Uh, we could not enter Gaza. Uh, we, through Amnesty, we have asked for permission to enter. We were denied entry as any human rights uh, activists and organizations were denied entry for the very same reason that the siege around Waziristan. It is easier to conduct human rights violation and war crime when there are no researchers there. But that war has happened in a very different juridical reality because the war began in July, but already in April, the Palestinian government has ratified the Rome status and Palestine has entered um, the international jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. And the understanding was that the, that, that war was about collecting evidence that could, could, that there is perhaps, with all the, and, and, and I know, I know what you're thinking. I know that, that we're thinking that the ICC is not perfect. Of course it's not perfect. But there was a, a chance, perhaps, to call for accountability uh, through it. And Palestinians, during that war, started recording more and more and more evidence on their own smartphones and cameras and continuously uploading them uh, online. We decided to try and reconstruct one day during that war, a 24-hour cycle. You know that Aristotle said that the tragedy is one full cycle of the sun. And in fact, that, it was, that day was the biggest strategy because it had most civilian casualty. It also had uh, another irregularity during that day. An Israeli soldier was captured. Um, and there was a fear that, in fact, the Israelis were trying to hunt down under the Hannibal Directive their own. There was huge stake in mapping out this event, in understanding where and when people died, in understanding, in timing the event, in reconstructing, in as much as we could, something, almost nothing, of that day. It took us a year to reconstruct that day. This gives you some idea about what it is to do forensic work, how much attention and how much time it takes in relation to how much time it takes to destroy, to kill, how much time it takes to investigate. And this is the kind of material uh, that we had in front of us. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of video clips from mainstream uh, media, from social media, material that was sent to us directly through the Palestinian NGOs and material that we harvested from uh, the internet. The problem was we were not ready. The problem was that most of that material came without the metadata intact. If we had the metadata, it would not take us a year uh, to establish the time-space coordinates uh, of this event. Sometimes when you have it, you have it. We know that bomb happened at 10.15. Uh, other, uh, you've seen how we do it. Uh, we are looking at the shadows. If you look at that, 
horrific bombing that we'll see now again and again and again. I'm sorry, it's the deadliest bombing during that day. 16 Palestinian civilians died at that moment. The person that recorded and uh, has captured two very distinct shadows on the map. If there is a shadow, there is time. We can reconstruct it. You've seen it before in the absence of digital time. We need to look for physical clocks in the image. And here, very carefully, very precisely, we're correcting the parallax distortion in the lens in order to build an architectural model and to run a sun simulation on it that would establish uh, the time. But sometimes you cannot really get it uh, the time very precisely because the images are too far away. And again, we got stuck. We were not, uh, we were not knowing how to continue, how to, how to sync the time space of the battle until we really understood that we are looking at the wrong side of the image. In fact, the sky part, the sky half of every image always contains smoke clouds from the bombs. And those smoke clouds are different. Clouds, smoke clouds are not unique at that, are under are object under complete transformation. At any given moment, they are different. They are physical clocks. And we needed to sync the clouds in the image in order to do it. We knew how to do it because uh, uh, on, on the previous war, we have looked at the architecture of white phosphorus cloud, and we developed technique to do it. And here in every image, we had clouds. So we needed to understand how they operate and how to, how, how to time the battle from it. So we made a cloud catalog, a cloud archive. Here, look at these uh, three uh, bomb cloud, very distinct. And then we were having um, footage from Palestinian ambulances. The Palestinian ambulances during that day could not receive calls. There was a jam on calls, on phone calls during that day. So what those brave um, uh, uh, medical teams were doing was driving into the smoke plumes. And they were having always a camera on the dashboard. Uh, and they were, so this is very useful material for us because it always had at the apex of the perspective the bomb plumes. So you could start looking at them. Are we looking at the same? Perhaps, let's look. Here, that cloud looked the same as this one and in this one. But the difference, the distance between this and this is different. Why? Because we're looking at a different angle. So can we now reconstruct the angle? Of course. This is exactly what we were doing as we got influenced by all sorts of theories of cloud mapping from the Renaissance onwards. Uh, we were really looking here at art historical techniques. Ruskin technique, Brunelleschi techniques of how to create perspective out of cloud. And what is in the cloud? Um, we were looking here uh, is uh, a chart that a very good and, and, and loved colleague of mine, Susan Shupley, has created, uh, classifying the dust in ground zero. And you know that the clouds of the bombs in Gaza are not much different. They are everything that the building was. Those clouds are a building in gas form. They're about 90% concrete. They're about 7% plaster. They're about 3% wood from the furniture. About 2% they are cloth. And they have about 1% human bodies. They have glass in them. They have all sorts of things. All that got mashed together into the cloud that is temporarily there for between 7 and 10 minutes uh, in, in, in a situation that continuously transforms go rising up in a column until the temperatures uh, are kind of evening up. It opens and rains the house, uh, the, the fragments of the house, onto itself. It's a kind of architecture turns into meteorology. It's soft architecture above hard architecture. So this is how we are starting to look at them. We find somewhere... Um, this video clip shows the bomb strike on the Tanoa neighborhood. Okay. Um, we, we're seeing the same, the same uh, video again, and we are looking at the clouds, and we think, is that the same bomb cloud? Perhaps, is that the same bomb cloud? You know, we're trying, we, we have thousands of those, but we need to divide them up and to look, and to try to sync all the videos so that we know, because as you remember, we, we know what the time here, so if we know what the time here, and it's the same, and it's the same plume, we could sync all that, everything that that camera is captured and everything that that camera is captured. So we need to tune very much to the architecture of the cloud, to the ever-transforming architecture of the cloud, and corroborate that form 
and uh, understand how from this we can actually, we're looking at the same object from three perspectives. So at the intersection of those three perspectives will be the place where that bomb fell. So clouds are in fact metadata. They have hold both information about time and space. They're of course also the building in gas form. They're of course also the bodies. This is what's so tragic about looking at the architecture of the cloud. But we had a visit that day by another very important element, a satellite image uh, that was not qualified, was, did not have to abide by the American resolution uh, restriction. It was a European satellite, and it was not reduced to and a half meter a pixel, but to half a meter a pixel. So we could see all of the sudden in that satellite image a bomb cloud, here a bomb cloud. Still, it is not, this is a zoomed in into a part of the image where we know from a witness that we were speaking to where a dead body of the daughter of that person is lying. That is a photograph of a dead body in half a meter a pixel. There is a body in this image. Two of those pixels capture her. I don't know which one uh, they are. And this is how we would start uh, syncing up and looking at that. So we, we, we're seeing now a sequence of photographs. Uh, all of them showing cloud, small clouds in transformation. We're looking at the metadata and it says quarter to midnight. This is not quarter to midnight. The metadata is wrongly set. So how do we actually figure it out? Well, the time gaps between the photographs are consistent. So we start creating a time panorama of smoke clouds in transformation. And we build up uh, that panorama slowly. And then we see that that image, and that satellite image has the metadata tag. It says 1132. So if we can see somewhere that smoke plume, we, would, we could sync the entire sequence because we have all the gaps in there. Yes, that smoke plume could be this smoke plume. Again, we're always corroborating what we're seeing. We're measuring it as it is transforming, trying to sync up those two clouds one from elevation, another from plan. I'm speaking kind of architectural lingo here. And here now, we can sync now the entire sequence. So we have here what we refer to in our work as the Rosetta Stone, because every form of every cloud with the, with the digital time uh, next to it. So now if we find another set of images, um, we could, we could and, and we know it's the same camera, yes. It has the same serial number. And yes, also, it has the same hairline on the lens. So although we find it somewhere else, we know it's the same camera. We know the time. We know the gap. We can start building a timeline of the event. Here, again, we see the same hairline without the metadata this time. Uh, we can place it, and we can start locating all the other images synced up by those monstrous clouds. Um, that uh, only after we would sync up the battle by looking at the clouds, we could look at the land and see what happened to people. What are the stories? What are the testimonies? Where and when uh, things were taking place? Here is the ambulance video I was talking about. You'd see uh, the ambulance driver. He's driving a motorbike. It's, a, it's an ambulance motorbike, a tuk-tuk. He's pointing at the clouds. Um, and here we're doing a shadow analysis and we can compare it also to these as you've seen before. And then we know exactly where it is and when it is because every cloud is a three-dimensional reality and we can start uh, syncing up uh, this, um, this environment. Um, now, we, because we are so tuned in looking at the cloud, we saw something we couldn't believe that we see, just like the rubber-coated steel bullet before, we could see those two bombs that killed those people in mid-fall. What bombs? Who is the manufacturer? Can we make a claim based on them? Here, we locate the craters, and we can measure them for the lawyers that need it for their own um, legal case. Here is the size of the craters. But we know here is the death radius of these bombs. Look, in the middle of a residential neighborhood to drop those bombs and, and create such a devastating uh, effect. Here is the bomb in mid-flight, in mid-fall. Here is the other bomb in mid-fall. How do we know how big they are? Uh, we are locating, we are architects, we are locating that image in space. 
uh, we, because we know how far the bombs are from the videographer. We know how big is the image frame here. It's 150 meters. We can measure it because we know from which building to which building it goes. So we can create an, a, a grid behind those bombs. We create a grid. We could measure them. If we can measure them, we know their dimension. We can go to the catalog. An American manufactured one-ton bomb uh, that w was dropped in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Uh, and this opens up, if, you know, what, what, what does it mean? I mean, it only means that it gives information for further activism to mobilize this information, to operate uh, with them. Later, what we are doing is that we locate all those images in space. Architecture is also a kind of an optical device, a way of arranging the time-space relation between images, of locating the witness testimonies. Here you see a bomb uh, that was falling, and the clouds become the hinges and the axes of the narrative. Uh, we can navigate the space through them, because every testimony would refer to another cloud. All the witnesses we're speaking to are located. The images are placed within the model in time and space. You cannot understand what we call the image complex, the time-space relation between a huge multiplicity of images if you do not locate them within architectural models. Architectural model is the only way to unlock and understand the relation between images. To start understanding something, very little of what happened there, but still the, the kind of the care to honor um, the risks sometimes that those people were taking by providing those images, by instead of fleeing, by photographing. Uh, and you could see exactly here, the cloud is transformed. It is separated. And yes, it is that cloud from this perspective. And we are able to create um, uh, that uh, image. Um, and finally, each one of those bombs had to be located. Each one of them is a story. Each one of them are people lost. Uh, each one of them is another uh, attempt. And you could see, you can walk, look at the, at the rest of the investigation online. Uh, we were also looking at different kind of technologies, technologies that would allow to see the destruction of vegetation as a way of understanding military movements. Uh, a, one of our collaborators, James Jamon van der Hoek, who was located at NASA at the time, uh, was looking at traces left on fields. Here you have one, two, three, four tanks. You would not see that in the eye, but there is, you, you see it through a sensor, agricultural sensor, that would show you the destruction of vegetation. So every tank, and tanks are going over agricultural fields, uh, it all of a sudden becomes visible on this, uh, in this technique. And you're seeing how they cross from Israel. This is the Israel side of the Gaza border. And really how they left from civilian settlements, uh, Israeli civilian settlements, going uh, into Gaza. All the choreography of battle becomes visible uh, in this technology uh, that is reading vegetation. Vegetation is something that becomes very important for us also in somewhere else. This is another investigation altogether. I'm now in Guatemala in a report that we do for war crime and genocide cases in Guatemala for the destruction of the Ishil Maya people in the Quiche region of Western Guatemala, uh, tracking with um, people from the area uh, to find the foundations of buildings that were consumed and overgrown by the cloud forest. Uh, really, you, you need to cut your way, sorry, to cut your way into the forest uh, to find them. To, um, to, to find a foundation, these are remains, foundations uh, of those buildings, and, and, and kind of find evidence uh, that is otherwise non-existence for a whole culture that was destroyed by the Guatemala military uh, in 1982. Here again, plants become very important. What we're doing is a kind of archaeology of the forest, of deforestation. This is a, a category that has been used by my very good collaborator, Paolo Tavares. Here, we're looking at uh, what you see here in red are areas, deforested areas. Uh, what you see here in green is the um, native area of the Ishil Maya people living in the forest, living from the forest, the way of life depending on the forest. But the genocide is not only killing of people there. It's an act of massive deforestation. It's a transformation of the relation between the natural and the built environment. 
There are other scales that we are looking at. Charles Heller and Lorenzo Pezzani from our group are looking at the ocean. They're looking at very, very weak signals. They're looking at forms inside within the sea. Here, um, we think the sea is just a, a plain, uh, homogeneous surface. It has forms, it has currents in it, and it has those uh, very uh, weak signals that would show you two boats uh, within it. And in fact, the, what you do not see between those two boats is a migrant boat uh, that in, um, during the siege uh, over Libya was actually drifting for about two weeks uh, in open seas amongst all those NATO boats that were not intervening and were not helping them. And that's a, war, that's a crime in a high sea to let people who call for SOS and not to be. How do you find a boat that you cannot even see uh, in, 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 in satellite images? Well, what they've done is, uh, together with uh, an oceanographer, reconstruct the ocean currents. People say, Movement on water leaves no trace, but the water is also a very thick sensorium. We know, we have information about the water currents, and the water currents, and the, from the moment where the drift started, this is, they made a phone call, they could subpoena the location, you have a moment of the beginning of the drift, and that is the path of the drift. So who was next to their drift? Who are all those boats that saw those people 70 people drifting, 60 of them or more dying out of starvation and dehydration at the time. You see all those boats next to it that did not intervene and that allowed an opening of another set of investigation. I show you that case just to take you across scales and to show you that forensic architecture is not simply about buildings. It's a way of seeing, it's a way of composing information visually within what we call the image complex, moving between point of view, looking at media, looking critically at media, understanding its limitation, its politics, its composition, what it is that we could see, but then what claims we can make with what we see, with, what, with our counter forensics. The legal process is only as good as the political process it is part of. Those evidence that we provide need support, they need mobilization, they need activism, they need us and you uh, in order to make uh, a kind of transformative politics based on traces, on weak traces and weak signals within the visual field. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Weizmann. Uh, mind-blowing to see the demonstration of forensic architecture at work. I'm very excited to get a chance to ask you a few questions and to take questions from you uh, in the audience. Uh, there are three ways to ask questions. There's a microphone in this aisle over here, and there's a microphone in the far aisle over there, and then you can also ask by Twitter using the hashtag WallX. And I can, now I can see that microphone, and I can see that microphone. So I will uh, have a couple of questions of my sure. own for you first, and then <coughs> I will take questions from the, uh, the audience. And I'll ask you to please keep your questions short and to the point so that we can get to all of them. And um, as well, I'll try and repeat a uh, question so that in case you haven't heard the question, you'll have a chance to hear it. What a remarkable display of, of how the tools of architecture are the only tools, really, that, that make this study possible. I'm very curious, so you, you know, a student of architecture, then an architect, at what point did you also realize that you were a detective? <laughs> yeah, uh, counter-detective, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I grew up in um, the, let's call it even the human rights struggle in Palestine, Israel-Palestine. Um, of the post rabin area, era. Uh, I remember when, um, when I was an architecture student, third year architecture student, I took a year out, and I was in Tel Aviv, and I went to this peace demonstration, and I didn't see exactly what was happened, but I was there when Rabin was killed. And um, 
you know, not that I was a rabbinist or anything like that, but, um, you know, it was a collapse of a certain, uh, at least, hope. And, um, and after that, I volunteered with a PLO, with a Palestinian Ministry um, of, ha of uh, Planning. And I realized that the Israelis were not giving them maps. Um, and uh, I was an Israeli, and I was kind of performing a kind of a very, very low level industrial espionage. Are you going, what was it in industrial espionage? I, you know, I was going to open sources to libraries and bringing maps of Palestine to Palestinians who were supposedly in a peace process but did not get it. And then uh, from that evolved a kind of a mapping project um, that of, uh, of the Israeli occupation uh, of the West Bank in 2002 that tried to implicate architects in human rights violation and violation of international law. And we were looking at crimes that were undertaken on the drawing board. Huh. And I think at that moment, forensic architecture began, if you like, or for me it began, um, not so much through destruction, but through a monitoring of, of construction for understanding that what we do on a drawing board has consequences and sometimes violence can be perpetrated on our computer screens, on our drawing boards, uh, even before it's built uh, in reality. I wonder if you could give an, an example uh, of that kind of architectural violence. Yes, uh, we were looking at, um, at, at settlement master plans. These are settlement illegally built on Palestinian land in the West Bank. Uh, but that's, that's, that's one order of the violation. The other one is, is the way that they were planned. And we were seeing that uh, Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem and, and settlements in the West Bank were built in particular form that would bisect Palestinian built fabric. I, they were built in order to generate material damage, right? Uh, we think of architecture simply as, as that which is there to serve, um, you know, its clients. But this kind of more or less state-sponsored project had another aim to it. It was not only to house settlers, it was to shrink and limit and bisect and cut apart Palestinian uh, space. So, um, so here we, we could see actually the moments in the drawing where it happened. The precise moment. Um, it's, it's fascinating to think that you can take uh, architecture and then deconstruct it in order to, to find these, these answers. Normally we think of architecture as, as a, a building, as, as a process of construction. Uh, not of destruction. When did you realize that, that, that it could also destroy in, in this way? Well, I, I see architecture not as a practice of building, although, as Derek very generously said, yes, I built a museum, I built this and this and various things. Also in Israel, which I, you know, it's a place, Israel, Palestine, it's a place I love a lot. I want to build, I would mm. like, this is what I would like to do. But architecture is also a field of knowledge. Right. Uh, it's a way of seeing politics, a way of seeing the world from an architectural perspective. I, for seen from architecture, politics is a certain process of materialization that leaves material traces. Uh, and from the toolbox and the intelligence of an architect, we can unpack various things, not only war crimes and human rights violation, but uh, uh, inequality, um, various other forms of uh, domination and uh, control uh, that, are, that are undertaken and distributed by and through the built environment. So forensic architecture kind of evolved, it tried to operationalize that kind of knowledge by saying it's not enough to be an academic and to, to analyze it and to, to put it in a you know, university press book and to publish it in journals, etc. In order to generate effect and political effect, you need to think forensically. You need for your evidence to be able to withstand scrutiny. Hmm. And this is what we do. I mean, we build our evidence, we corroborate and cross-corroborate everything that we do to such an extent that um, until you know, we would we 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 would accept that now it can stand 
a very fearful and very strong counter-examination. And uh, with the understanding is that it takes a lot to show the obvious. What we show, everything that we show, we should not have been able to show. We should not have, it should not be necessary to show it. It should not have been necessary to demonstrate that the drone warfare destroy houses, homes, residential homes in Waziristan. It's, it should be obvious. We should listen to the people there. Sometimes you need that to, to, to support these claims. It is not necessary to show because we know how many people died in Gaza. And yet it is. In order and to yet prove it. it is. Um, because uh, in our world, to, to, to be able to have political effect, you need to, um, to be able to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is, this is something that is important. It's not everything. And it needs the activism behind it. And it needs other form of claim. And it needs other form of mobilization. Uh, they're all very necessary uh, in order to, to to arrive at political transformation. But I think that's a modest part of that large thing, which is a political struggle, is is, is that practice. I want to take a, a question from, from the crowd over here. Please, sir, go ahead. Thank you very much for your inspiring lecture. My name is Corky Day, and I would like to ask if you would consider the destruction of empty Jewish homes to prevent them from being occupied by anyone else later to be a crime also? I'll repeat the question. The question um, is whether you would consider the destruction of empty yeah. Jewish homes to be a crime to prevent them from being occupied by other persons later. Yeah, it's a, it's a fabulous question. I think, it's, uh, I think you probably refer to the 2005 disengagement plan where um, Israeli military and the settlers were taken from the ground. It's not that Gaza is no longer occupied or under siege, but 21 settlements were evacuated. And for the, for the reason that Arabs would not live in Jewish homes, the government decided to destroy those, created enormous uh, environmental damage also, because buildings are solid toxic waste. You destroy them, and they just go into the aquifer water. But more so, what was lost there is exactly a possibility for a very complex architectural problem, architectural cultural problem. And that is a question of how one could live in a house of one's former enemy. And I think that uh, there's something very important about about that negotiation, imagine you're a Palestinian. The settlements are the very instruments of your supervision, incarceration, etc. They've been evacuated. You enter there. You enter into the one thing you want to smash. But there's also a kind of a critical and careful way of their transformation. And, and we have established a practice together with Palestinian, my very good Palestinian friends, uh, Sandy Hilal and her husband, Alessandro Petty, in, in, in Bethlehem, we've established a, a, an architectural office exactly that would deal with these questions of how to live in a house of your enemy, what we could do in order to transform settlements and military bases into places that could be places for the equal uh, inhabitation of both Jews and Palestinians in a situation where there is no occupation, where there's no domination anymore. In, in case that would come, we were kind of looking well into the future and trying to imagine it architecturally. So thank you for this question. Thank you for the question. I've got a couple of tw uh, questions via Twitter here. Um, this one is uh, from at JB Murray, who asks, what's striking is the tremendous investment of time forensic architecture requires very striking indeed in, in, in your talk. Uh, the question is, does it scale? Does it scale? Well, I, I think every scale, and you, you saw today something, an investigation about split seconds, a split second of somebody's killing. You saw an investigation that's undertaken on a time scale of a day and on a space scale of a city. And you saw something which is on a scale of the environment. In, in the Quiche part of Guatemala. 
And I think that w in whatever scale you work, each one of those cases fossilizes into itself political relations and political histories that are larger than itself. If we do a case of a killing, think about all the police killings across the border um, of, of, you know, such as, you know, documented by Black Lives Matters and other organizations. These are not individual events. These are political uh, events that, with roots that, that extend hundreds of years back. And, and that, is the, that is really the, the essence is here to investigate something in its specificity, something that is named and something that is part of a specific project while still insisting on long political histories to extend that case, to open it up in space and time. So yes, it, those relations are, are, are scalable, but in every scale, history, the long history of domination is fossilized. I uh, have a question. I think at this microphone, do we have a question? Yes. I have a question. Hi. Hi, uh, Thanks for your talk. Um, my question is about, I realize that not all the um, um, cases you're putting together and evidence are for to appear only in court, but to have a political effect on other communities or people who want to speak about these things. But I'm quite interested in, um, because you talked a little bit about almost how the images are going to testify, but we also know that they don't testify when you take them to court, someone speaks to the image, right? So, and I know that Lawrence Abu Hamdan, for instance, has gone recently to appear, I think, as an expert witness. So it's very interesting to me that as artists um, would become taking on this role of the expert witness yeah. with, this, with this imagery. And so the kind of relationship between the speech you have to give, which I think you eloquently just did, but I kind of want to hear more about this testimony in court and also if um, a witness who had helped you prepare this material would then also speak to this material in court, or would it just be you or someone as an expert? So I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll repeat no, the question. Uh, just that, that the, the question is uh, to hear more about the testimony of experts and artist experts in court, and as well whether witnesses who would have helped with the preparation of the testimony would have to appear yeah. in court. So first of all, I would say I, I love forensics because the truth is established through conflict. Uh, it is not established by independent object, you know, we are always taking the side of the victims. Wherever situation we are, we are advocating for them with our skills. We always face experts that are state experts or military experts. They are also, you know, advocating for their. The truth is established through a confrontation. Whoever evidence could withstand scrutiny and cross-investigation. And in that cross-investigation, very often, as Judy's question uh, has been posed, the credentials are as important as the thing that you're showing. And the credential depends on two things. What is your CV? What did you study? Now, when we come and we send expert reports to court or to other, and, and by the way, not, not all the investigations are for court. We work for different forums. When we send them, um, the court would always be surprised. What, who, who, you know, why everybody that is signed on that expert reports are filmmakers and theorists, right? Theorists like um, Jacob Burns, architects like Nick Axel, Christina Varvia, uh, filmmakers like Stefan Kramer. Um, of course, you know, uh, um, Susan, an artist, theorist. Um, this goes like, you know, I mean, why don't you leave that for the big guys? This is like, you, this is kid stuff, art, no? I mean, this is not serious. And, and, and we have to actually claim for art as a mode of interrogating images. Um, it's not art and the aesthetic practices as a sensibility of fictionalizing. Just like I said, architecture is a way of interrogating the world image-based practitioners, filmmakers, photographers, have a way to understand image, the materiality of the image, the, the, the pixelation of it, as, as you've seen. Um, 
how to work, you know, so much of this work is filmic work. It needs composition, it needs montage, right? We're doing and we're showing the way we're doing it because we know that when, when we need to present it in court and defend it, they would ask exactly how we're doing it. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a bad metaphor, but I would say what we do is like a cooking program. We, 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 you know, we do and we tell you continuously how we do it, right? So it could be scrutinized. But we absolutely must insist for architects and image practitioners and the aesthetic practitioners to be considered experts of sort that are in excess of science, that we could see things that scientists could not. And so we can reconstruct the truth in a different way. And I think that um, the patience, the, the kind of radicalization of seeing, understanding that seeing today in the world is construction. It's not a passive act of having the world kind of enter through your eyes. In order to see today in the image complex with so many images, we need to compose the time-space relation between them. And therefore, Christina Varvia was composing, sitting with her team and uh, creating architectural models that will allow us to see. To see is to construct. It is not simply to absorb. And this is where, this is our modest contribution to kind of creating accountability or, or, or calling, it's not creating, there is no accountability, like calling for thinking towards accountability. I've got a follow-up question from Twitter that follows up on exactly this point. Uh, this is uh, a question from at Arab Glam Daddy. And the question is, has there been any success taking these cases evidence to courts? Um, yes, uh, some of them were successful uh, in the sense that we won cases. Uh, you, you've seen the, the shooting incidents led to somebody being indicted. Um, the state is very reluctant to actually pursue it and the trial it keeps on being postponed. Um, yes, I mean, it is possible to do it. The, 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 the question is not always, though, whether you win or lose a legal case. Because sometimes you can win a legal case and the political consequences of that um, will become more dire. The question is how to connect what's happened in court and the juridical language to a political reality outside. How you get this to mobilize that. And sometimes you can articulate a claim in court. You can make something heard that would not have a space to be heard otherwise and being reported upon and have the attention that it has. And even if you lose it, that claim has been uttered. And in the long run, it might be productive. We, we do not know. I mean, we're living in a situation that is so desperate. Um, the level of violence is escalating. There's so much despair that, you know, even if um, we do not often succeed, uh, the very belief that there is any even remote chance of accountability is what fuels our work. One of the things that, that leaps out to you when you, when you see the work that you, that you talked about and that you showed is just the enormous amount of material that you have to deal with in order to come to any kind of, of conclusion. I'd be very curious to, to hear more about how do you even begin when you decide that you're going to investigate something? It must feel overwhelming to think of where do we start? Where are we going to find our images? When we have our images, how are we going to deal with the thousands of images that we may come across? What's, what's the process? Have you established a process over the years for diving in? You know, I mean, the, the, the first question goes before that. It's what we're going to investigate. When you are, you, you know, I mean, you've seen, we do not only work in Israel-Palestine, but Israel-Palestine for a human right activist is the land of plenty, unfortunately. Um, it's just too much. The question is to decide where to act, where pressure is going to be tactically productive, where you think it is. If you're going to take the Nakba Day killing, yes, could you open the history of the Nakba through it? Could you open the very risk to Palestinian teenagers uh, that has never been investigated, in fact? Um, there's never accountability, although dozens and dozens are being shot by the military 
in, uh, in the West Bank. Uh, in Gaza, we could not investigate the whole of the Gaza war. We could only, we, as I said, we, we spent one year in a huge team to investigate one day because we thought that one day is, contains within it a certain kernel, historical kernel, that, um, and, and you could see what it is if you follow and, and look at it online, um, that could become important. So that is really, first is the kind of acupuncture, hmm. where, where to put pressure. Uh, second is a certain form of collection and understanding, are we looking at an image problem? Are we looking at a material problem? Sometimes you have access, you can touch the stones, you can touch the house, you can start haptically reconstruct and see. So is it, is it a, that kind of archeology? span is it an image archaeology, an archaeology of the image? Um, is it a case of satellite? You know, so, so within each, and then we'll compose a team uh, that would include both the image practitioners, the architects, uh, the filmmakers, if it's necessary, the multidisciplinary kind of team that, that, that would deal with that. And I have to say another thing. We never do the same case twice, in a sense that when we have now developed a technique of syncing clouds, we would not do it again, because our mandate to ourselves is to produce techniques also for other activists to be able to do it. So we are like kind of like a think tank, no? Huh. That would produce, you know, and 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 contain and 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 take paradigmatic cases in order to invent new techniques, and and the next case that we would take will be completely different, and we. So every case we would take, we have never done before. There is no building of expertise. What there is, is a kind of heightened sense of, uh, of concentration, of, ra of, of intensity of research uh, that is important for us. So we would tend to take very small things and spend an enormous amount of time on them simply because we do not know how to do it and we have to invent our own techniques every time anew. Got a couple more questions here from, from the audience. And uh, it is getting close to the end, so I'll encourage anyone else uh, who wants to come up. I think I could take one more after these two from the audience. So we'll go over here first. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's been a pleasure listening to you. Um, you're bringing an, an abstract component here to science. It's about time. <clears throat> so I wanted to kind of say that Palestine is a huge issue for everyone, and to me, it's, a, um, it's an indication of what's happening worldwide. I mean, the theater is over there, but <clears throat> the lack of transparency is everywhere, and the military is everywhere. So what I wanted to ask you is, if you lived in Vancouver, which I don't think you do, do you? Uh, no. Okay, so you're, I not, want to, you're though, not from after. here. <laughs> I'd well, like okay. to. But no, I'm joking. So what I'm wanting to do is I'm sort of doing my own uh, counter forensis here in Vancouver, which is a beautiful city, as everyone knows. But there is a kind of a quiet war that is going on here, and it's the downtown east side. It's right along Hastings, and it's a sort of a quiet war. Can and I ask how you just get to the question just okay, because we so have limited time, sorry. I guess what I'm saying is that there's a lot of activism going on there and it doesn't seem like people care much. Uh, the buildings are going down, new buildings are going up, people are dying. The lowest, most vulnerable people in this society like Palestinians, the drug addicted, the uh, alcoholics and the homeless are dying, and they live in very, very expensive real estate here in Vancouver. And uh, it's a very strange, um, quiet, silent occurrence of moving them out. And I'm wondering if you, if you were to forensically look at this, what, how you might approach this, counter forensis wise. Thank so you. So thank you very much for this question. I, I think that uh, the question was obviously about um, um, gentrification, I suppose, and uh, unequal distribution of spatial resources. And I, I think that, 
I'm looking at urban warfare, which is a kind of um, radicalization and escalation of processes that happens in any urban environment. Urban life is conflict. The idea of a city is the idea of interest of different people constantly in collision with each other. Um, I do not know, I, I cannot comment on your specific case. I can say that, you know, I would initially kind of identify and, and perhaps support any, and, and, and I'm heartened by seeing that there is political activism here, but, but really to understand that urban warfare is not only the Americans in Baghdad. Urban warfare, urban conflict is what we live continuously. And we need to know that there are struggles to, to be had and, and to be fought uh, on our very mundane and, and local environment. Thank you for the question. Um, one more question from the audience here. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. It was fascinating and inspiring. My name is Zoe. I am a journalism student. So my question is regarding a comment you made at the very beginning where you said that um, the issues are complicated by the very nature of the media that reports on it. And I'm wondering if you can comment on um, positive and helpful ways that media can support the work that you're doing in forensic um, architecture and looking into human rights violations because it is a very complicated issue with many forces at play as you've talked to and political um, issues and and forces and so what are what are good positive ways and helpful ways that journalists and media can can represent the complexity but still communicate it to an audience that maybe doesn't want to read a lot um, without oversimplifying I'm just yeah that's yeah, I mean, we, we work together. I mean, we, we cannot work without the media. It, to, to generate effect, political effect, we need to perform very specific in a particular forum, whether it's legal or not, juridical or not. And we need to have an issue opened up to a wider debate via the media. So obviously, um, that, 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 that is something that is incredibly positive uh, for us. But I would say that I am myself very much identifying myself with investigative journalists. I see myself as some kind of investigative journalist in the sense that my way of seeing the world is architectural. I will investigate it architecturally. And, and I think that looking architecturally at political issues that have been written on from a political perspective, from a human rights perspective, uh, this is not spatial, or um, so from a sociological and economical one could benefit from the architectural dimension. And I, so I think we need to increase our sensibility and sensitivity to architectural facts as political realities. Thank you. I've got a, a, another question uh, from Twitter here. This is from at AM Johal. And the question is, what are the limits thus far for forensic architecture as you see them? We have only limits. <laughs> it's not <laughs> like that there is a limit that we could do everything. We don't know how to do uh, As I said, we, we're entering the situation. We don't know how to do We have so many failures with so many false starts and, and changes, uh, etc. The limits are the, the availability of witnesses that would work with us, the, the limits of, of media, the limits of capture, the threshold of detectability. All our work is about it, it's always we work until we arrive at a certain limit, and then we need, we, we've arrived there, so we need to go that way in order to compensate for that limit. It's all about management, management of our, uh, of the enormous limitations that we have on seeing. I, I would never claim that I know anything of what happened during the 1st of August 2014 in that, uh, in, in, in Gaza. I, I, I know so little of it. I do not know the experience of all the people that were under fire. I do not know the experience of, of the combatants, of the soldiers. Some of them also delivered testimony. Uh, Israeli uh, soldiers delivered testimony through breaking the silence. Absolutely essential testimony. I do not know the experience of, of, of Israelis. Uh, you know, of, of, the, the reality is infinite. What you can do is just... In the dark, you have 
you have, you have dust, you have, you have fragments and ruins, and from them you're trying to compose something that is so fragile, that is so inadequate to respect people's experience in them, yet that's what we have. And, 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 and we need to do that. And, and by doing that, it, it's almost kind of like my way and the, the way of my team to, to pay our respect to the dead and living. And, and by the way, to all, if it's in Palestine, to all people living in Palestine that we care deeply about, Israelis, Palestinians, Jews, Arab, Christians, it's not, you know, that there, there is a, there is a deep concern and a deep care that um, for the future of this place, and I cannot tell you that I, I, I have never been more worried than than I am right now. So it it is really a work that is done through enormous pain, and and a sense of desperation. It is not a certain heuristic or anything that we we we, we think this is something that everybody should do or, or should celebrate at all. What you see is really the, a, a desperate attempt to do the very little that we can do, uh, and there's so much more that we can do. Uh, your passion is clear, and uh, the work that you do is, is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your work with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks very much indeed, Al. That was in so very many ways a masterclass in what I think advanced studies ought to be. I lost count of the number of fields that you and your team crossed with such skill and dexterity. But it's more than bringing a team together and the collaborative pursuit of knowledge and truth. It's more than drawing upon so many different disciplines. I sometimes think that the hallmark of advanced studies is a kind of disciplined undiscipline, if you know what I mean. But it's also exemplified, I think, by that commitment to forensis, to bringing that work to a public audience and to engaging and listening to a public. And you know, you do know that Walter Benjamin once said, I have nothing to say, only to show. And I think what you've done this evening is finesse that by showing us that you have something both to show and to say. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Before you go, I would just like again to thank our sponsors, the CBC, the Thai, and the Georgia Strait, the wonderful staff of the Peter Wall Institute and the Vogue Theatre. Nothing would have been possible without you guys. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Paolo, and again, thank you, Al. Good night, and travel safely. Thank you.